All right, so we collected some simple data in lab, and I want to show you how we're going to summarize those data, how we're going to calculate the descriptive stats, and then how we're going to take those descriptive stats and make figures. And so I want to show you step by step how we're going to do this. I want to explain why we do this. And I also, I want to show you how to do these figures properly so that in future labs you already know how to do them. All right. And so we're going to talk about descriptive stats first. And then I'm going to show you how to calculate them and how to graph them. Now you recall that we took some very simple data um, when we're talking about the platyhelminthes. And we had each group take their planarian and flip it and then record which way it rolled to write itself. Again, we're curious. Um, do they have a preferred side? You know, is it like right-handed versus left-handed where most of them tend to go one direction? Or is it completely random? Anyway, we had each group do this, and then we had each group do this five times for their worm, and then we collected all those data, and that's what we're going to graph. Um, so now, I have given you some um, example data, and so I'm going to work through that example data, but it should look very similar to the actual data that you collected in class. So let's look at it. And so here's some example data, and you can see that we've got several different groups. And then we have how many times they, their worm rolled right and how many times their worm rolled left. Okay, And so this is our raw data. And so if we're asking the question, um, you know, is there a tendency for the species to roll one way or another, we could sort of look at these two columns to try to answer that question. But it's difficult because you've got a lot of numbers. And so... Just by scanning these numbers, you might get an idea, but you really don't have any confidence in your results. What we need to do is take a lot of raw data and summarize it in a way that makes it easier to understand and makes it easier to look for trends. Um, and so that's what we're going to do first. And this is what we use statistics for. We use statistics as a way of summarizing the data and looking for trends. And so we need to simplify the data. We need to spot trends. We need to take a lot of numbers and reduce them down to few numbers. Basically, we need to describe the raw data. That's what we do with something called descriptive stats. So descriptive stats describe raw data. Now, when you typically think of stats or you heard the word stats, you know, a lot of times you're talking about like baseball stats, like a batting average, right? Um, those would be descriptive stats. It's just a way of taking a lot of observations and reducing them down to something to make them easier to understand. So you're describing the data. We also have stats that help us test hypotheses. And so if we have a hypothesis, we collect data, we can use that data to infer something. We want to infer if our hypothesis is, uh, if we reject the hypothesis or fail to reject the hypothesis. Those are called inferential stats, and we'll get into those later. And so we have two broad categories of stats. Descriptive stats describe inferential stats test hypotheses. The inferential stats are built from the descriptive stats, um, and they're all built from the raw data. And so these are skills that you learn as a scientist to help you look for trends in your data to see if your data are um, likely or unlikely and to help you try to understand the question that you're studying. Today we're going to concentrate just on descriptive stats. Um, later in the semester we're going to actually do some hypothesis testing and we'll also use inferential stats. We always start with the descriptive stats though because we always want to take a look at our raw data, summarize it, look for trends. Okay, so here again is the raw data. This is our made-up data. Your data should look a lot like this. Um, and so I want to, again, I want to know if there's a tendency for planarians to roll to one way or to the other. How can I reduce all these numbers just to a few numbers, which will help me sort of understand things better, and which will start to lead me to an answer to this question? Well, you know, very commonly, or, or, or one way to do this is I want to ask myself, what's a typical planarian? 
Typically, what does a planarian do when you flip them on their back? That's kind of what I'm asking with this question here. Um, and so I want to know what is a typical value. What's a typical number of rolls to the right and a typical number of rolls to the left? Um, an easy way to do that is to calculate the average. You're familiar with the average. This is sort of what we use an average for. You know how to calculate an average. And the average sort of tells us what is a typical value. Um, and so if we calculate the average for these numbers, you see that on average, the planarians rolled right more than they rolled left in this made-up example. Okay. Um, we also call the average the mean, and so I'll use those interchangeably. Sometimes I'll say average, sometimes I'll say the mean. This is what we call a measure of central tendency. And think about that phrase, because that phrase makes a lot of sense, central tendency. The values tend to be, what's the, you know, what tends to be the center of all the values. Now, the mean is not the only measure of central tendency. It is the most common and the one we'll use most often. Um, later on, we can talk about things like the median, which is another measure of central tendency. But most of the time, your measure of central tendency will be the mean. And again, from this mean, you have it under a little bit better understanding of the data here, right? And so on average, we can say the planarians tend, you know, a typical um, direction to roll is to the right for a planarian. And that's what descriptive stats do. We've just described the raw data. We took a whole bunch of raw data and we summarized it and it helps us it's a little bit easier to understand. And that's all we're trying to do here. Okay, so are we done? You know, we've got the mean. Is that all we need? Absolutely not. The mean is not enough. This is where we get into a lot of trouble. And a lot of um, things that you hear, you know, online or on the news, um, a lot of times in, in advertising, when they talk about, you know, the average response, they just give you the average. But the average by itself is a useless number, okay? There are other numbers that you need to help you understand, where am I at? Those average numbers. So let's talk about that. The first is just the sample size. I mean, if I calculated this average and I said, okay, you know, on average, they they roll right more than they roll left. And you said, well, how many, how many planarians do you test? And I said, two. Would you be impressed by that? I mean, that seems silly, right? If I only looked at two worms and I calculated an average, you don't have a lot of trust in that average. If I did 200 flatworms and I calculated an average, would you have confidence? Would you trust that number? You'd have a lot more trust in that number. And so when you're looking at an average, you must know how many observations were used to calculate that average, and that's the sample size. Now, I said, you know, two is not impressive, 200 is impressive. Somewhere in there, you know, what's the magic number? You know, is three enough, is four enough? I don't know, I don't, there's no answer to that, okay? I can't really tell you what's the magic number, you know, to where you go from not trusting the average to trusting the average. When we get to inferential stats, we can talk about that. But what I am telling you is you absolutely must always report the number of observations. We call this the sample size. It's abbreviated by the N size. And this is also an essential value that you must always report. And so this is an easy number to calculate, right? You can just count them up. And we had seven in each group. Um, so again, if you ever give me an average, you must also give me the end size upon which that average is calculated or from which that average is calculated. Okay, so now do we have enough? You know, now not only do we know what the, the average is, but we know how many worms we looked at or how many observations we looked at. Is that enough? No, that's still not enough. So let's look at a different example. Here's a different example from another class. And this is looking at the ratio of two types of lipids in zooplankton at three different sites. So we're just looking at lipid levels in zooplankton, which are microscopic animals, from three different locations, and we 
We're just trying to summarize those data. Okay? And so we can do the same thing as before. We can calculate the mean and the sample size for each location. And that's usually the first thing you do. And here are those values. Now again, uh, X bar is just another symbol for the mean. So if you see X bar, that just means the mean or the average. And so we've got the average for each group and we've got the sample size for each group. Okay? But again, that's not enough. Um, one thing I want to point out while we're looking at this is look at the number of decimal places. You need to pay attention to decimal places. I don't know if I have a good rule. You know, there are rules about significant digits. I don't know if I have a good rule for that. But what I do know is that when you calculate these things, your computer or your calculator gives you like, you know, 20 decimal places. And students will just copy and paste that. You can't do that. You can't use, you can't report all those decimal places. That implies precision that you don't have. And so you need to pay attention to your decimal places. Um, and we'll talk about, I mean, I don't really have any good rules, but I have some idea. But here, all these values were taken to, you know, two decimal places. We'll take all of our means to two decimal places. Now, if we look at these means, we see that this location and this location had the exact same mean, okay? And so if we just looked at the mean and we see how many observations are in each one, we've got, you know, that's an interesting result. These two have the same, but scan the raw data. Look at the raw data in this location and the raw data in this location. Now, although they have the same mean, just kind of eyeballing it, do they seem to be the same? They're not really the same, right? You've got um, these numbers are all much closer to one another, and these numbers are more spread out. And so that's also an important difference that we need to measure and we need to report. One group has a lot more spread around the mean, and this is another thing that you must always report, all right? And so when we look at the measure of central tendency, and in our examples, it's the average or the mean, that gives us a typical value for each group, right? And so, you know, in these groups, a typical value is, in these two groups over here, a typical value is, you know, 1.61. And in this group, a typical value is much lower. Um, and if you measured, you know, a, a zooplankton lipids at random in any one of the, you know, in this group, would you expect it to be exactly equal to the mean? No, you wouldn't expect it to be exactly equal. That's just a typical value. Um, that, that value is sort of in the middle of all the values. That's why it's central tendency. Um, you also want to know how typical is the typical value, right? So you want to know are most values near this typical value or are most values not near this typical value? This typical value, again, is in sort of the middle of all of them. Are all the values sort of clustered around this typical map value, this central value, or are they spread about? That is also important to know. And so again, you've got the same mean in these two groups over here, but one has much more spread around the mean. And one's group, this group's values are all much closer to the mean. That is also very important to know when you're describing stats, describing raw data. Um, and so this is our last thing that we must always report. It's the spread around the mean. Um, and so only when you have a measure of central tendency, the sample size, and a measure of spread, that's when you truly have a feel for the data. That's when you've truly described to the data. Any one of these by itself is useless. Any two of these by themselves is useless. You must always report all three values. If you report one, you gotta report the other two. Otherwise, you really don't know what's going on with your data. Okay, so we have to measure this spread around the mean. How are we gonna do it? One typical way is to calculate the variance. And so if we look at this example, I've calculated what's known as the variance. And you see the variance for each group is right down here. And so now for each group, I've measured central tendency, 
sample size, and spread around the middle. And you'll notice that if we look at the raw values, we said that this group tended to have more spread around the mean, and you see that that's reflected in a higher variance level. And that's exactly what we want. And so we want some kind of a number that tells us, you know, do you have more spread or less spread? Okay. Um, how do we calculate the variance? It's pretty simple. Um, basically, you know the mean. We want to know how much the raw data are spread around that mean. So we'll take each observation and we'll subtract the mean. All right? And so for each observation, if you're close to the mean and you subtract them, you get a small number. And if you're far from the mean and you subtract them, you get a big number. And so overall, if we have more spread around the mean, when we subtract the mean from each value, you get bigger numbers. And so um, let me just show you some hard numbers here to, to, to kind of settle. So if you look at one of the locations, here is a spreadsheet I made to kind of look at these values. And so if you look, these values are the same as that, uh, uh, that first group. I think it's the first group, yeah. These are the same as the first group in the previous slide, okay? And so here is the group mean, which I already calculated. Now again, you see that Excel gives me tons of decimal places. But when I report, I only report the first couple of decimal places, right? So don't ever give me a number with that many decimal places. So I've calculated that mean. That's the central tendency. Here's each individual value that I measured. And so in this column, I take each value and I subtract the mean. So 1.85 minus 1.61 is about 0.23. And 2.28 minus 1.61 is about 0 0.6. And then I got some negative numbers. 1.19 minus 1.16 gives me negative 0.4, and so on and so forth, right? So you can see how if for every value that's close to the mean, this difference is going to be pretty small. And for every value that's far from the mean, this difference gets bigger. And so over the entire data set, you know, if you've got a lot of spread, these numbers are bigger. And if you don't have much spread. So you see how we're, we're measuring spread around the mean. All right. Now, we want to get the total spread for the entire data set. And so what seems logical would be to sum these up, right? And so if I summed these values up and there was a lot of spread, that number would get big. And if there wasn't much spread, that number would get small. Here's the problem. Never works. Because you're subtracting the mean, you get just as many positive values as you do negative values, and the sum will always be zero. So it doesn't do you any good, right? Although this makes logical sense to calculate spread, if you sum those values, it gives you zero, so it's a useless value. How can we take all these values and combine them to get a useful value? Well, all we got to do is square them. And so let me back up one, and you see this last column is where I take this column these differences, and I squared each one. So 0.238 squared is 0 0.05. 0 0.66 squared is 0.44, so on and so forth. And so if I take all these values and square them, that makes them all positive. And so if I've got a big difference here and I square it, it gets even bigger. If I've got a big negative difference and square it, it gets big and positive. If I have a small difference here and I square it, it's not very big. But I always get a positive value. And so now if I sum those values, now I have something that as the spread gets bigger, this number gets bigger. And as the spread gets lower, this number gets lower. That's exactly what I want. And since I'm summing up all these squared values, this is called the sum of squares. And it's a very common thing that you're going to run into. Anytime you see anything written SS, sum of squares, that's what it is. All right. So now by looking at these numbers, hopefully you can see how we were looking at the spread around that mean. And so as that spread gets bigger, then the numbers in this last column get bigger. And so then their sum gets bigger. And that's a way we measure spread. Now, that is not the variance. That's the sum of squares. To get the sum of squares, we divide. We kind of want to look at the average variance. And so, um, so we take this and we divide it by n minus 1. 
And so we take the sum of squares that we just calculated, we take the n size, which is 7, we subtract them. So we divide this by 6, and we get this. And that is the variance. Okay? And so that is one way to measure spread. Um, however, it's not commonly reported. Commonly, we take the variance and we take the square root of it. And then that value is called the standard deviation. And that is much more common. And so if you take 0.14, which is the variance we calculated, and then you take the square root of 0.14, you get 0 0.374, 375. And that's the standard deviation. And that's the number that you typically report. Why do we do this? Well, because these numbers are squared. And so these are in squared units. And so by taking the square root, you get back to the original units. That's really the reason why we do that. At any rate, now we have the three numbers we must always report when we're doing descriptive stats. We've got central tendency, which is the mean, represented by the mean. We've got sample size. And then we've got a measure of spread, which in this case is standard deviation. Again, there are many ways to measure central tendency. There are many ways to measure spread. These are the most common. And that's what I say here. Usually this is what you're going to report. Okay, and so now if we look at our lipid example, we take the square root of these variance values, and we see again that as the spread goes up, so too does the standard deviation. And so although these groups had the same mean, and you might say, well, these groups are similar. They have the same mean, but they're not really similar. Although they have the same mean, this one has much less spread than the other one, as reflected in the standard deviation. And should I trust those numbers? Well, that's based upon the end size. How many times did I measure it? Always report those three. All right. And so that's kind of the, the take home message here. You, you can't report just one of these. You can't report just two of these. They're only useful if all three of them are reported. Um, there are others you can use. We'll talk about some other measures of spread here in a second. So let's go back to our planarian data. That was some zooplankton data. Let's go back to our flatworms again. And so if we look at these groups, and we can kind of, you know, we see that the mean is greater in one. We see we've got the same n size in both. But we still need to measure the spread of our example flatworm data. So let's calculate the standard deviation for each. And here, when we put the standard deviation, we see it's actually equal for both groups. That's uncommon, okay? Um, usually, your groups aren't going to have exactly the same spread. In this experiment, it will always happen. And that's because, you know, this and this always sum to 5. Like, everybody did 5, and so these values are linked, and so the spread is linked. It's, so it's just a weird thing that happened because of the way we collected the data, okay? In most of your other experiments, it'd be very odd to see exactly the same value. In this one, you happen, it just so happens it will always be the same value. Just no biggie. Okay. All right. And so I've shown you how to kind of do this by hand, but of course our data is in a spreadsheet. And that's the beauty of spreadsheets is we can do these calculations much easier. Um, and then we can take those calculations and we can graph them. So uh, the next step is I'm going to show you how to do these things in Excel. And then later on, I'll show you how to make a graph. We're going to do this work in Excel, not Google Sheets. We collected the data in Google Sheets because it was a shared file. Google Sheets does graphing, but later on, we'll see that Google Sheets does not do error bars very well. And Excel does. And so that's why I'm going to show you how to do it in Excel. And you've got to do your homework in Excel because otherwise you won't be able to make the graph the way I want you to make it. All right? We'll talk about that later. Okay, so um, let's jump over to Excel now and let me show you how we can do these calculations in Excel. Okay, so here we are in Excel and you'll recognize that this is the same example that I gave you and the same example that is on the PowerPoints. And so I just want to show you how we can use Excel to calculate these values. And so we've got our raw data and they're organized in this way. And then I've got all the things I want to calculate here. Average, 
sample size, standard deviation, and standard error. And so um, you're probably familiar with Excel. I'm not going to get too much into all the different tricks in Excel. But if we want to enter a formula, we select the cell where we want the formula. And so here we want to get the average number of rolls to the right. And so to enter a formula, I'm going to click on the cell and I'm going to type equals. And that tells me I'm going to put in a formula. And I want the average, and guess what? If I want the average, I just type in average. And then an open parentheses. And then I select the data that I want to average. And so then I want the average number of rolls right. So I select all the raw data that's a roll right. And then I close parentheses. And I hit return. And there's that average. And now I don't have to type that again. Since I set this up properly, the left rolls, the raw data for the left is over here, and I just need to copy this over. And I can do this a lot of ways. I can select the cell, and I can go Control-C, move over, and go Control-V. If I want to undo that, I go Control-Z. Or I can, of course, use the copy and paste up at the top at the bar. I can right-click and copy and paste. But the easiest is to grab this little square and just drag it over. And it just copies it over. But you see, now, if I look at the average formula, it's averaging D2 to D8. It's averaging these numbers. If I double-click on the cell, it highlights which cells it's working on. And so although I moved that, copied that formula over, it was smart enough to know I want to take the average of these numbers, not the original numbers. Okay, so I got that. Now I need sample size. Now here, you know, we could just count up the samples. There's only seven, right? I could highlight them. And then I could come down here to the bottom, and I could see the count is seven. Um, but once you start working with bigger data sets, you don't want to do that. And so what you want to do is have Excel count it. So if we go equals, count, open parentheses, select the same cells again. Now I can just hit return and it'll put the closed parentheses in for me. And it'll count up all the cells that have something in them or have a number in them. Okay. And so if I were to go and delete a number, you see both the average changed and the sample size changed. But we don't want to delete data, so I'm going to control Z and we're back to where we started. Same deal. Copy this over. There's sample size for those squares. Double click on this cell. You see it's counting those cells. Standard deviation, just as easy. I'm going to go equals STDEV. And there are several different ones. You can use STDEV, uh, S, doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to use STDEV. If you're on a Mac, I don't know if it has STDEV. I think you have to use the STDEV S. Again, it's very, very technical and very unimportant. Open parentheses, select, return. There's my standard deviation. Copy it over. Same standard deviation, but that's just because of the weirdness of these data. You know, if I changed this value to 2, you see a standard deviation would change. But that's not the original data.